Hello, everyone. I'm John Horrigan, and thanks so much for joining me on Journey Through the Past. This program is being brought to you by the Hudson Council on Aging. Hello to all of you watching on Hudson Cable Access and to those who are members of the Hudson COA. The views and opinions expressed are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Hudson Cable Access or the Hudson Council on Aging. Any content that I provide is of my own personal opinion and is not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. This program is entitled Great New England Blizzards. Now, I must say, when I talk about blizzards in this presentation, I'm focusing primarily on Boston. But as you know, Boston does not receive the uh, great snowfall amounts that, say, northern Massachusetts or western Massachusetts would receive, or uh, the other states of New England, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, uh, Vermont, and New Hampshire. So keep that in mind. So what's a blizzard? We're going to take a look at what is the meaning of the word blizzard, the great blizzards of the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, and into this 21st century. We'll talk about the great snows of 1717, blizzards during the American Revolution, the triple big snows of 1786, the snow of cane of 1804, cold Fridays and freeze-ups, and the June snows of 1816, and the luminous snowstorms of 1817, as well as the great snowstorms of the 1830s, and then we'll look at the great cold storm of 1857, the blizzard of 88, that's 1888, and the Portland Gale. And then, of course, the remarkable blizzard that we all remember, well, some of us do, the blizzard of 78. And then we'll wrap it up with the storm of the century and great storms of this century. So what is a blizzard? It's a term coined by an Iowa newspaper editor by the name of O.C. Bates in 1870. Severe storm condition characterized by low temperatures, strong winds, and can include heavy snow. And by definition, the difference between a blizzard and a snowstorm is the strength of the wind. To be categorized as a blizzard, a snowstorm must have winds in excess of 35 miles per hour and reduce visibility to 1,300 feet or less and must last for typically three hours or more. The 1972 Iran blizzard, which caused approximately 4,000 deaths, was the deadliest blizzard in recorded history. Let's talk about three landmark winters of the 17th century. Winthrop's severe winter, 1641 to 1642. Increase Mather's severe winter, 1680 to 1681. And something I call the terriblest winter, 1697 to 1698. So Boston Harbor froze over in the winter of 1641 to 1642. And there were bitter cold, long continued freezes and deep snow from January 28th to March 3rd, 1642. Native Americans hadn't experienced a winter like this since the late 1500s. John Winthrop pictured there. Horses and carts went over in many places where ships have sailed. They passed with loads of wood and six oxen from Muddy River to Boston. And when it thawed, it removed great rocks of above a ton or more weight. The snow likewise was very deep and especially northward, above three feet and much more beyond. Now, November 22nd, 1641, Winthrop says, a great tempest of wind and rain from the southeast all the night, as fierce as a hurricane. Divers, boats, and one bar cast away in the harbor. The day after it came to southeast again and continued all night with much wind and rain, thereupon it being about the new moon, followed the highest tide we have seen since our arrival here, which is 1630. Increase Mather's severe winter. That was 1680 to 1681. But before we get to that, historian John Hull said that the winters of 1654 to 55, 1656 to 57, and 1665 to 66 were very severe. In fact, Increase Mather said uh, of the 1680 to 1681 winter, he said it was the coldest known these 40 years. That's Increase Mather on the right. This is Judge Samuel Sewell. And he said, quote, January 20th, Charles River frozen over, so to Noddles Island. In other words, the Charles River was frozen all the way out to modern day Logan Airport. He continues, March 10th, courageous, spelling incorrect, south wind breaks ice between Boston and Dorchester Neck. Hath been a very severe winter for snow and a constant continuance of cold weather, such as most affirm hath not been for many years. The terriblest winter. 1697 to 1698. Town records of Sudbury say, quote, the terriblest winter for continuance of frost and snow and extremity of cold that was ever known. 
John Pike, recording in Dover, New Hampshire, said that the first snow fell on November 20th, 1697, and the last fell on April 9th, 1698. There were 31 days of snowfall, including major blizzards on November 1st, December 5th, January 9th, February 9th, March 3rd, April 4th. One a month. Sewell again, Judge Samuel Sewell. The prodigious length and strength of the winter, he noted. And then Cotton Mather, Increase's son, said on December 30th, this day, there being a violent storm arisen, preached refuge from the storms of the wrath of God. February 1698, Cambridge had 42 inches of snow on the ground. And on March 25th, Sewell reported that snow was still a foot deep in Boston. Charlestown Ferry froze up so that a boat did not go over once from January 27th to March 10th, 1698, a span of six weeks. weeks. Now the great snows of 1717. Let's take a look at this woodcut here. You see a man on the right on a horse. Gives you a scale on how deep the snows were. There's a dog in the foreground as well trying to get out of the snow and a man trying to push his way with some sort of broom or shovel. Now, Cotton Mather's account was read before the Royal Society in London, and it was in the first publication made by the Massachusetts Historical Society. On February 27th, 1717, a typical New England nor'easter passed through with snow falling on some areas, while other areas received a mix of snow, sleet, and rain. Cotton Mather. The first major snowstorm occurred on March 1st, with another on the 4th, and a third, the worst amongst the three, on March 7th. At some points, the snow would lighten and stop, but the sky would remain cloudy, showing no signs of clearing. Mather says again, the Indians near a hundred years old affirm that their fathers never told them of anything that equaled it. So in other words, he's saying that back to the late 1500s, they hadn't seen snow in this quantity in Boston. Four successive major snowstorms within 10 days took place from February 27th through March 17th, 1717. Cotton Mather says as mighty as snow as perhaps has been known in the memory of man is at this time lying on the ground. Boston received 40 inches, estimated four feet deep in Andover and three feet deep in the woods of Dorchester. Five feet of snow with drifts of 14 feet were reported on the post road to New Hampshire and Maine, and travel from New York to Boston was impossible for a time. They were literally snowed in. <clears throat> Vast numbers of cattle died. Some were frozen standing up. Here's a gruesome story. Two of 100 sheep were found in a 16-foot snowdrift. They were said to have been buried for 28 days and then dug out alive. Apparently, they survived by eating the wool of their dead companions. And 95%, you can hear snow plows outside, how ironic is that? 95% of, of the immobilized deer population was killed either by starvation, wolves, or bears. And there were 25-foot snowdrifts reported in western Massachusetts. Now let's look at blizzards of the American Revolution, 1774 to 1783. I'm going to talk about the wreck of the General Arnold, the largest ship at the time in the fleet of the 13 colonies in 1778. Now, the General Arnold sailed from Nantasket Road in Boston Harbor on Thursday, December 24th, 1778, along with the privateer Revenge, bound for the West Indians. Privateers, just another cute name for pirates. Well, the Revenge, due to its speed and expert navigation by its captain, Captain Barrows, cleared Race Point at Provincetown and beat the impending storm. But the captain of the General Arnold was James McGee. The impending gale would be labeled in posterity as the Hessian Storm because it struck Newport, damaging a Hessian camp and some British ships. It was also called the Great Christmas Storm or after Captain McGee, McGee's Storm. Now, McGee tried to make Plymouth, but wound up off of Gurnet, which was an isthmus outside of Plymouth Harbor. There's a map. Gurnet, right-hand side, right-hand corner, and then you can see Saquish Neck dipping out into Duxbury and Plymouth Harbor. There's an area here called Brown's Bank, or the Flats. We'll talk about this in just a moment. This is where they believe that the General Arnold was wrecked. In fact, I met a gentleman, Peter, who lives in Saquish, who pulled up an anchor that was circa the late 18th century, which could be the anchor of the General Arnold right here in Brown's Bank. So he anchored the General Arnold less than a half mile off of the gleam of Garnet Light. 
instead of trying to get into the harbor without a pilot boat. Again, shallow shoals, it would have been, especially with choppy surf, it would have been very dangerous for him to try to make Plymouth. That's bug light on Gurnet, Gurnet light. So by midnight, the storm intensified into a gale and the General Arnold was imperiled. Now, this is the only accurate depiction I could find of the General Arnold. You can see it's an enormous ship. And the waves rode higher and higher and breakers crashed against her. Suddenly, the General Arnold began to drag anchor and she drifted toward Plymouth Bay. Captain McGee ordered the masts to be cut away and the crew went below to fetch axes. When the men didn't return on deck, he went below to find that they had broken into the rum stores and they were drinking heavily. McGee's ship was now sinking into the sand and most of his crew was drunk. So he pleaded with them and then he bullied them into cutting away the masts. They didn't want the ship to drift. The storm intensified in fury by the hour. This was one of the most severest gales ever experienced. In Boston, after the storm, a man would be found with his ox frozen, standing straight up. The General Arnold was being battered. The seams of the ship opened and water began to gush in. Within an hour, it was three feet deep below deck. The crew of 120, including Captain McGee, then moved up to the quarter deck for safety. They lay on top of each other three and four feet deep. A tent-like structure was made out of the topsail. As dawn approached, the snowfall became heavy. Some of the men, unable to move, were suffocated under the topsail. Instead of getting lighter with the waning dawn, the skies grew darker and darker. Whiteout conditions ensued. The men were becoming encrusted with an icy, salty sea spray. Officers abandoned any thought of discipline with the crew, and they made preparations to die. McGee ordered the rest of the rum rations then to be doled out. Some sailors poured it down their boots to forestall the freezing of their feet, and this activity may have saved some lives. As the day wore on, one of the toughest officers aboard, Captain John Russell, tried to rally the men and urge them to hold on, and then suddenly he dropped to the deck and died instantly. The water on the deck was now ankle deep. Just as they thought that all was lost, the tide began to recede. As night fell, many saw this receding tide as an encouraging sign. At dead low tide, the wreck was half exposed on white flats, Browns Bank. Then the wind veered to the northwest around midnight, and a bitter wind chill froze the soaked men's clothes. Some men, due to the weight of their clothes and their inability to move, fell overboard. More than 30 men had been lost. As dawn on the 26th came, a longboat was put over with three men who volunteered to row to shore for help. They rowed over to the edge of a solid ice block about a half mile away and walked over to a schooner, went aboard, and abandoned their comrades. The remaining survivors on deck raised a great cry for help, desperately trying to get the attention of Plymouth residents. McGee tied a handkerchief to a stick and waved it frantically. The people in Plymouth did see them hours earlier, and they had sent out dories, only to have them trapped in ice flows. The second day wore on. Rescuers set out on a causeway of boards across an ice flow towards the brig, but were still a long way from the vessel. Now came the coldest night, the 26th of December, and by this time, only around 50 men were still alive. That night, including the wind, the temperature dipped well below zero. With the biting icy air, the remaining survivors of the General Arnold had to take desperate measures. They stacked up the frozen corpses of their comrades to form a windbreak on deck and then sat down in a circle inside the cadaver barricade and crossed their legs over one another. They moved their legs back and forth to restore circulation in their bodies. When one fell asleep, the others would shake him awake, and this is how they passed the second night. As dawn came on the 27th, the sun rose in a cloudless sky. Many had perished, literally frozen stiff, with their legs crossed, their arms folded or straight out in front of them, some clinging to the half-mast. The Plymouth men continued building the ice causeway and were making great progress across the ice flow. At 10 a.m., they were within hailing distance of the ghost ship, the General Arnold. Soon the sleds and boards were moved close enough to the brig and contact was established. 
It is said that the men who boarded the General Arnold on that bitter morning never forgot what they witnessed. With all of the men huddled together, most frozen stiff, it was impossible to distinguish between the dead and the dying. As Barnabas Downs lay on the deck, he could not indicate to the rescuers who walked past him that he was still alive. He heard the men refer to him as dead. As he lifted his body to be thrown into a corpse pile, he managed to roll his eyes, and one of the rescuers saw him do it. He was placed on a sled and taken ashore over the causeway. Downs, a Barnstable on Cape Cod, was taken to a Plymouth home and placed into a tub of cold water. After three hours' immersion, he was revived enough to suffer excruciating pains as the blood began to circulate through his thawing limbs. Downs later said that the pain was much worse when he was regaining circulation than it was when he was freezing to death. Captain McGee was brought ashore and attributed his survival to the rum that he poured in his boots. Due to the deep snow, word did not leave Plymouth about the disaster for several days. The town of Barnstable lost 12 men. When Barnabas Downs Sr. arrived on the scene by horseback, only his son was alive out of the 12 Barnstable boys. An improvised ambulance, a feather bed slung between two horses was made, and Downs Jr. was lowered onto it. He was taken to Barnstable, and although he was given the best medical care, he never fully recovered and lost the use of his feet. He had to walk on his knees for the rest of his life and used a push cart too, but he became a prominent citizen in Barnstable. Of the 120 men on board the General Arnold, 33 came ashore alive and nine died shortly afterwards. 15 recovered completely and nine were crippled for life. After that, horror. Captain James McGee every year held a party uh, for the uh, widows of the men lost in General Arnold and those who survived. And uh, he never forgot uh, that devastating storm. And now we find in this 21st century, this year, 2020, 2021, there are people that want to actually excavate the graves of these men in a Plymouth cemetery. Uh, there was no list of uh, those who were on board because they were pirates. So we don't know who the men were. And these archeological grandstanders uh, want to dig it up and exhume the graves and, and test the DNA. I disagree. Remember that placard about my own opinion? That's here now. Please, uh, General McGee would have wanted these men to lay sleeping in their graves. The February 24th, 1777 whiteout. Philadelphia saw two feet of snow. New Jersey, 15 inches. Dighton saw two storms, one of 18 inches, another of 12 inches, for a total accumulation of 30 inches. The hard winter of 1779-1780. It was called the most hard, difficult winter that was ever known by any person living. Deep snow, severe cold, widespread suffering from Maine to Georgia from New Orleans to Detroit. New York and Boston Harbor froze over. It was the height of the cool 100 years or the little ice age that took hold circa 1750. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. You can compare this winter to the brutal winters of 1697 and 98, which I spoke of, and the winter of 1740 and 1741. They had three back-to-back-to-back -back -back behemoth blizzards. On December 28th through 29th, 1779, they saw 18 inches. January 2nd through the 3rd, 14 inches. January 5th through the 6th, 14 inches. And even December 18th in 1779, they had a 17-inch snowstorm. But Connecticut saw between 42 inches and 48 inches of snow, four feet of snow. And the total snow accumulation in Massachusetts that year, 1779 to 1780, was 95 inches. The following winter, 1780 to 81, they only saw 25 inches. And then it was brutally, bitterly cold in Hartford, Connecticut. Below zero on January 2nd, 8th, and 19th, where it was 13 below. Below zero on the 21st, 23rd, and 25th of January, where it was 16 below. And on the 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, where it was a remarkable 22 degrees below zero. 
and also on January 31st. And then it warmed up to the single digits in February. On the 1st, it reached 2 degrees. And then it was in the single digits on February 5th, 7th, 9th, 13th, 20th, 22nd, and 24th. A brutal, brutal winter. I do question, though, the measurements taken in Hartford. I believe that their thermometers were off a bit and perhaps measured uh, too cold and extreme temperature. Just my, my opinion. Anyways, travel ceased, social life non-existent. Sound familiar? Shipping halted. The thaw finally came on March 7th, 1780, and most bridges were damaged by ice flows coming down the rivers. Now, the winters of the American Revolution, the severe winter, that winter that I just spoke of, 1779 to 80, and also 1781 through 1782. There were moderate winters, 1775 to 1776, 1776 to 1777, and 1777 through 1778. There were mild winters, 1778 to 79, and 1780 to 81. Now let's talk about the triple snows of 1786. By November 20th, Salem Harbor had froze all the way out to Naugus Head. 24 hours after boats had passed along the Connecticut River at Middletown, Connecticut, the ice was strong enough to support horses and sleighs. Snow fell on December 4th and into the next day without interruption, leaving 20 inches of snow on the ground in Boston. It was 9 degrees below zero in Hartford. Hundreds of tons of hay were lost at Rowley and floated to Ipswich due to one of the highest tides in North Shore history. Wharves in Boston were flooded and goods were lost. Grain, casks of rum, and textiles. When the ship Lucretia foundered, five of its 11 hands jumped into the boiling surf. They made it ashore alive, but perished due to exposure in the snow when they went searching for a house on Point Shirley in Boston Harbor. But the six men who stayed on board rode out the storm and survived. A Mr. Elwell and a Mr. Pulsiver who were clamming were caught in the storm. They sought shelter in a haystack in Rowley, and the haystack, frozen, was then carried out to sea, and the men leapt from ice floe to ice floe and found shelter on an island near Ipswich until they were rescued. The sloop Thomas was wrecked in Marshfield, losing the captain and two deckhands. Twelve were lost on a sloop that was wrecked on Levels Island in Boston Harbor, and a sloop crashed on Gurnet Beach, just where near where the General Arnold went down, and the men found shelter at the lighthouse. Some of the men had wandered north on the beach, found a duck hunter shack with a loaded gun, and they used it to start a fire to keep warm until the rescue party came. And then the 5th of December had been chosen as the date for Daniel Shea's rally in Worcester, but due to the storm, it was postponed, and Shea's rebellion, an attack on the Springfield Armory, would be thwarted in February of 1787 after two militias were raised. Now, the second storm began on Thursday, December 7th, and then abated. But on Friday, December 8th, it snowed for two days through Sunday morning, leaving roads impassable. And according to the Massachusetts Gazette, people were paid to level the streets. Now, this is the first instance of public servants removing snow from the streets of Boston and getting paid for it. Several people were caught in these storms and went missing, only to be found frozen to death later. The snow cane of 1804. Uh, snow fell recently, October 30th, 2020, in the Boston area, and it also fell in southeastern Massachusetts uh, in early October 2009. I remember the Patriots played that day in snow. But dawn on October 9th, 1804, Noah Webster, a noted historian, said, Such an event is very remarkable, the only one I have found recorded. Gale force winds from the Hudson River Valley in New York to the Massachusetts coast. It had been unseasonably cold in early October, and 20 inches of snow fell in parts of western Massachusetts. There were three to four foot snowdrifts in the Green Mountains in Vermont and the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Rain turned to thunder snow with lightning violent wind. Uh, we've experienced thunder snow here over the past few years in Boston, and many orchards were destroyed. Uh, Massachusetts was the cider capital uh, of the United States at that time. Uh, destroyed many pear, peach, and apple orchards. The Catskills in New York saw 12 to 18 inches of snow, and the western slopes of the Berkshires in western Mass had snow depths of 24 to 30 inches. This is October. 
but 3.66 inches of rain fell at Yale University in New Haven, and only rain and heavy winds were recorded in Boston, Providence, and Worcester. Now, let's look at the cold Friday of 1810. January 19th, 1810. November, December, and the early part of January were mild. That is until 4 o'clock in the afternoon of January 19th, 1810. A snow squall brought a wind shift to the north-northwest. In Salem, it was 45 degrees Fahrenheit, but by 10 a.m. the following morning, it was minus 5 below. Amherst, New Hampshire, not including the wind chill factor, saw a temperature of minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit but a strong piercing 50 mile per hour wind made it feel like minus 45 below. Instant frostbite for those who ventured out and many were frozen to death on the roads. The Ellsworth family had their home blown down in Sanborn, New Hampshire. The father, Jeremiah, packed the children and his wife into a sleigh and went for help, but the sleigh was blown over and all were frozen stiff, except for Jeremiah who was rescued. He suffered frostbite, went blind, and went insane. Now let's talk about great cold Fridays of old New England. Cold Friday 2, I call it. January 23rd, 1857. There was a bad decade uh, for weather in Boston. In fact, January of 1857 was the coldest month of the 19th century in Boston, and it began after a snowstorm of January 18th and 19th. In Bath, Maine, they registered a temperature of 52 degrees below zero. In Craftsbury, Vermont, they set a 24-hour record with a mean temperature, average temperature, of minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And then cold Friday the 3rd, February of 1934, and it was the coldest month since that January of 1857. In fact, February 9th, 1934, it was 18 below zero in Boston, 17 below in Providence, and 15 below in New Haven, Connecticut. Bloomfield, Vermont was 41 degrees below zero. The high for Burlington, Vermont that day was nine degrees below zero. And there were also cold Tuesdays in 1788 and again in 1855. And there was something known as the cold Sabbath in 1773. How about some New England cold snaps? Boston Harbor froze over completely in the years 1817, 1821, 1832, 1835, 1844, 1856, 1857, and 1869. In fact, in 1856, slaves could cross Boston Harbor from South Boston all the way out to Thompson's Island. And the first Liverpool liner, Britannia, arrived in Boston on February 1st, 1844, and it was frozen to its berth. And that evening, over 250 men hacked through the ice and carved a channel so the ship could depart from Cunard Lines Dock in Boston on February 3rd, 1844. And here's a painting by John Stobart. You can see in the foreground people cheering as the ship is freed and then the workers standing on the ice pack freeing the Britannia. Some other Extreme cold temperatures in New England. Falls Village, Connecticut, 32 below on February 16, 1943. Van Buren, Maine, 48 below on January 19, 1925. Chester, Mass, recently, I guess, minus 40 degrees on January 22, 1984. Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire, 46 below on January 28, 1925. Kingston, Rhode Island, 23 below on January 11, 1942. And then Bloomfield, Vermont, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit on December 30th, 1933. Now, there are a lot of things that can impact weather, and some of them are volcanic eruptions. And some of the major volcanic eruptions to impact North America uh, in regard to its weather. Uh, there was the Minoan eruption, the island of Santorini, which took place between 1645 and 1600 BCE. Mount Vesuvius, uh, 79 AD, which destroyed Pompeii. Mount St. Helens blew its top in the late 1700s. The Mount Hood Lava Dome blew in the late 18th century. There was the Lockheed Iceland Haze, the Lockheed Haze, June of 1783. It caused major worldwide climatic changes, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Mount Rainier uh, went off in the 1790s. And then recently, Krakatoa, 
1883. And then in 2010 in Iceland, a volcanic eruption stopped air traffic from April 15th through April 20th. It could happen again. Let's see if I can pronounce this. I Yafa Yala Yokel. I think I got it. The Lockie Hayes, as I was mentioning, 1780 in the Northern Hemisphere it impacted Western Europe, Scandinavia in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, it was Ben Franklin who attributed the dust in the upper atmosphere to a volcanic eruption, and he guessed correctly, in Iceland. Now, Mount Tambora, you can see it there in the red circles, it blew its top. It had prehistoric eruptions in 3910 BC, 3050 BC, and 740 AD. But the first eruption uh, in the modern era at Tambora took place on April 5th, 1815. Thunder was heard 250 miles away. Then there was a major blast on April 10th. It was heard from 1600 miles away. And people who heard it thought it was the sound of firing cannons. Now, sulfur poured into the stratosphere, causing a GCA, that is, a global climate anomaly. And in the spring and summer of 1816, a persistent dry fog was observed in the northeastern United States. Now, you may recall recently, in the last few months um, of 2020, especially the late summer, the sun was obscured by smoke from wildfires 3,000 miles away on the West Coast. And um, even... Uh, smoke impacted New England all the way back to May of 1780 uh, when they had a dark day caused by uh, smoke from fires in southern Ontario. But anyways, the fog reddened and dimmed the sunlight such that sunspots were visible to the naked eye and neither wind nor rainfall could disperse this fog. And the average global temperature decreased by about 0.7 to 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cause significant agricultural problems around the globe. Now, 1816 was the second coldest year in the Northern Hemisphere since AD 1400. The coldest year was the year 1601, which followed an eruption in Peru at Hawaii Naputina. Now, the 1810s are the coldest decade on record, a result of Tambora's 1815 eruption and other suspected eruptions somewhere between 1809 and 1810. Much livestock died in New England during the winter of 1816 and 1817 due to starvation and cold. But Tambora had help. There were other large volcanic eruptions that took place during that same time frame. 1812, La Soufriere on St. Vincent in the Caribbean. Also in 1812, Awu on Sangihe Islands in Indonesia. In 1813, Ryukyu Islands in Japan. 1814, Mayon in the Philippines. And the results were that these other eruptions had already built up a substantial amount of atmospheric dust prior to the eruption of Mount Tambora, which was the largest in 1,600 years. As is common, following a massive volcanic eruption, temperatures fell worldwide because less sunlight passed through the atmosphere. And it caused famine in North America, Europe, and Russia, and also social unrest. But there was also a mysterious eruption in 1808. We know that there were other major eruptions beginning in March of 1808 in the Philippines, through early May in the Azores, and also in Chile around the year 1810. But shown by this graph on the right. Sulfate concentration measurements were taken from ice cores in Greenland, and they tell of yet another major eruption somewhere between Indonesia and Tonga, impacting the climate severely in the Southern Hemisphere and to a lesser extent in the Northern Hemisphere. There's the island of Tonga in the center, Indonesia to the left. It, it happened somewhere in between those uh, two, two nations. Let's look at some other eruptions that took place over hundreds of thousands of years. First, we have Yellowstone, 640,000 BC. Of course, you've heard in the news about Yellowstone may erupt again. It's just one vast quaking lava dome. Of course, there was Santorini, circa 1610, plus or minus 14 years um, uh, near Greece. You also had uh, Tambora in that larger circle there. And then, of course, Krakatoa, 1883. And then some place called Taupo off the coast of Australia, 22,500 BC. 
So then we get to the year without a summer. It was called the year without wine, the year without food. Um, it was called by some 1816 and near frozen to death. In May 1816, frost killed off most of the crops that had been planted in New England. In June, two large snowstorms in eastern Canada and New England resulted in many human deaths. There was a foot of snow in Quebec City in June of 1816. And then what followed was famine, malnutrition, starvation, epidemic, increased mortality. But it snowed in Newton, Massachusetts, Salem, Massachusetts, and even on Boston Common on June 7th, 1816. Now, summer snow is an extreme rarity, though May flurries sometimes occur. A May snowstorm took place in 1977 in the Boston area, for instance. Historian John D. Post has called this the last great subsistence crisis in the Western world. The unusual climatic aberrations of 1816 had the greatest effect on the northeastern United States, New England, the Canadian Maritimes, Newfoundland, and Northern Europe. Typically, the late spring and summer of the northeastern United States and southeastern Canada are relatively stable. Temperatures average of both day and night, average about 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and rarely fall below 41 degrees Fahrenheit. July and August, lake and river ice observed as far south as Pennsylvania. Many New England farmers were wiped out and tens of thousands struck out for the richer soils and better growing conditions of the upper Midwest, which was then the Northwest Territory. In fact, Joseph Smith set out for Utah to establish the Mormon church. Tambora erupted in 1815, so why wasn't the summer of 1815 rather than the summer of 1816 the year without a summer? Uh, well, there's a time lag between a volcanic eruption and a change in weather patterns caused by the length of time needed for stratospheric winds to distribute the volcanic dust particles around the world. Now, in response to the food shortage caused by the year without a summer, the British government abolished income taxes in the year 1816. And in January 1816, a blizzard of brown snow hit Hungary. It was described as flesh-colored, and the snow's unusual color was the result of mixing with the volcanic dust from Mount Tambora. In the spring of 1816, Italy experienced red and amber-colored snow. And on June 5, 1816, it was 91 degrees Fahrenheit in Salem, and it dropped to 32 degrees Fahrenheit by June 7th. Incredible drop of 59 degrees in a matter of less than two days. Near Danville, Vermont, snowdrifts were over 34 inches high. Massachusetts physician William Bentley wrote in Waltham, Massachusetts on June 12th, quote, in few seasons have we heard more bitter complaints against cold weather than since June has come in. In fact, he reported frost in Waltham, Mass on July 8th. In Franconia, New Hampshire, Edward Holyoke wrote on June 7th, quote, exceedingly cold, ground frozen hard, and squalls of snow throughout the day, icicles 12 inches long in the shade at noonday. Checking out this map here, the dark blue co color there in France and Western Europe shows uh, a temperature drop of minus average, minus 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, while uh, they showed an increase of 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in Western Russia and Eastern Europe. Now, if you look at the violent volcanoes, the eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815 was the biggest in recorded human history. You can see the cubic miles of ejecta, volcanic ash. Mount Tambora, uh, Tambora 19 cubic miles of ash. Krakatoa, 1883, four and a quarter miles of uh, ejecta. Uh, Mount Vesuvius, AD 79, three quarters of a mile of ejecta. And Mount St. Helens, recently 1980, only a quarter cubic mile of ejecta. And just looking at how volcanic eruptions can spread uh, through time and space, at the time of eruption, uh, a few hours later, there's a pyroclastic flow. Uh, perhaps a few hours to a day later, a tsunami or tidal wave, and then there's ash fall in the coming weeks, and then finally the global supply chain is disrupted, famine starts occurring, and of course in the modern era, uh, jet airliners and jets will be grounded due to uh, volcanic ash in the atmosphere, and then within the next few years, you feel the climate effects. 
Let's look at uh, the year without a summer, some of the art. This is Landscape with Rainbow, painted in 1810 by Casper David Dietrich. It was an awful decade. This is Two Men by the Sea, painted in 1817 by Dietrich. And you can see the skies there, dusty, cloudy. It's not even cloudy, it's just obscured. And then, of course, the famous Chichester Canal by J.M.W. Turner in 1828. He loved to paint sunsets, and you can see the, the atmospheric effects still lingering a decade later. Another painting by Turner. This one here is Weymouth Bay with the approaching storm uh, in Ireland, in Cork, painted by Constable in the year 1816. Lancaster Sands by Turner in 1826. And then here, uh, the eruption of the Sufriera Mountains in the island of St. Vincent, 1815 by Turner. That happened in 1812. And then what about horror in the year without a summer? Well, in May of 1816, Mary Wollstonecraft, along with her lover, Percy Bysshe Shelley, depicted here, her sister Claire and her lover, Lord Byron, Lord Byron on the left, along with Dr. John W. Polidori in the center, were all cooped up in a chalet on Lake Geneva due to cold and rainy weather. And when July came around, Percy challenged everyone to write their own frightening tale. Well, Lord Byron wrote his poem, Darkness, and he actually describes what's going on in the atmosphere. Quote, when the fowls all went to roost at noon and candles had to be lit as at midnight. Polidori wrote The Vampire, and of course, Mary wrote the modern Prometheus or Frankenstein. Now you heard me briefly mention the Little Ice Age. Conventionally, it's defined as a period extending from the 16th to the 19th centuries, but some experts prefer an alternative time span from about 1300 to the year 1850. Now there was a medieval warm period uh, that took place in the late dark ages to early middle ages. There was also a early Roman warming period that took place uh, at the turn of the first and second centuries. Now, the Ice Age uh, had three particularly cold intervals, one beginning about the year 1650, another about 1770, and the last in 1850. Remember those Boston temperatures I told you about? They were all separated by intervals of slight warming. Now, several causes have been proposed uh, for the Little Ice Age. Cyclical lows in solar radiation, that's sunspots or, or a lack of sunspots, heightened volcanic activity, changes in the ocean circulation, the thermal haline circulation, variations in Earth's orbit and axial tilt, called orbital forcing, inherent variability in global climate, and decreases in the human population. An example, the Black Death of the 14th century and the epidemics that emerged in the Americas following European contact in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, a famous period of low solar activity was known as the Maunder Minimum, which ran from 1645 to 1715. And it happened at a similar time as the Little Ice Age in Europe. But the fall in solar activity was too small to account for the temperature drop, which has since been attributed to volcanic eruptions. Now, the year without a summer occurred during the Dalton Minimum, which lasted from 1790 to 1830, or from 1796 to 1820, although sunspots were actually visible to the naked eye from both the United States and Europe at sunset during the month of June in 1816, which may have also contributed to temperature variations and irregularities in upper atmospheric winds, which we call the jet stream. This is a diary from a man in Maine uh, during 1816. And you can see on the right-hand side, he's got two dots there. He could actually see sunspots uh, with the naked eye. Now, we're just leaving solar cycle 24. Solar cycles are marked off in increments of 11 years and uh, since they started measuring them. Now we're entering solar cycle 25, which began anywhere between December 2019 and April 2020. Now, NASA feels that solar cycle 25 will continue to be relatively quiet like solar cycle 24 was, perhaps even the lowest in 200 years. And they compare this dormant sunspot period to the dormant periods of the Dalton and Maunder minimum, with the sunspot maximum 
where solar flares will erupt, the sun will awake, they believe will take place in 2025. Of course, if solar flares can cause blackouts, um, they can destroy satellites, uh, they can cause perturbations in the upper atmosphere, aurora borealis. Um, the most famous solar event was known as the Carrington event. Uh, in September of 1859, massive aurora was seen uh, as far south as Alabama, and uh, it caused telegraph lines to send electric shocks. A lot of the telegraph operators received shocks on the line, and some of their messages were reverberating and echoing even after they left their station. And uh, during 1859, some miners in Colorado actually got up in the middle of the night because they thought it was morning. Anyways, at the peak of the solar cycle, about 0.1% more solar energy reaches the Earth, which can increase global average temperatures anywhere between 0 uh, 0.05 to 0 0.1 degrees centigrade. So there's a minimal impact on Earth, or so we suspect. And you can see in the graph there on the far right-hand side where NASA is predicting the peak of solar cycle 25 in about the year 2025. That's all we need. Anyways, the impact of magnetic storms on Earth's weather is believed to be minimal. The eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, for instance, cooled Earth by up to 0 0.4 degrees centigrade for several years. Well, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and also the El Nino phenomena causes variations of up to 0.4 degrees centigrade. And it's small compared to uh, human-induced global warming, which has been accumulating at 0 0.2 degrees uh, centigrade per decade since 1980. Now, NOAA scientists have concluded that four factors determine global temperatures. One, carbon dioxide levels, a lot of them emitted by man-made factories, volcanic eruptions. Third is the Pacific El Nino or El Nino pattern. And fourth, the sun's activity. Here's the approximate size of Earth uh, in comparison to a major sunspot on uh, the sun's surface. It was a major eruption that caused a blackout in 2003 here in New England. Now, what about the extended solar cycle? Double it up, 22 years. So there are some people that don't believe that uh, we're in for a dormant period. They think the opposite will occur. On the left, you can see oppositely charged magnetic bands represented in both red and blue, and they march towards the equator over a 22-year period. When they meet at the equator, they annihilate one another. On the right, the top, the top animation shows the total sunspot number in black on the graph and the and contributions from both the north in red and the south hemispheres in blue. And you can see they match up pretty directly. And the bottom shows the locations of the spots. That's known as a butterfly graph. But in direct contradiction to the official forecast by NASA, a team of the University of Warwick scientists and led by the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, NCAR, is predicting that the sunspot cycle that started in late 2019 could be one of the strongest since record-keeping began. And then... In 1817, bizarre weather phenomena, the luminous blizzard of 1817. January 17, 1817, in Massachusetts and Vermont, a severe snowstorm was accompanied by frequent purple lightning and heavy thunder. We have here uh, experienced in New England over the past two and a half years, two bouts of thunder snow. Now, St. Elmo's fire reportedly lit up trees, fence posts, house roofs, and even people during 1817. John Farrar, a professor at Harvard, even recorded the event in his memoirs in 1821. And then again in February 1817, due to the high voltage static discharges from the hats and fingers of people in Vermont, many people were shocked getting into their sleighs or even by shaking hands. Now, this is due to particles of volcanic ash in the atmosphere. A buildup of static electricity was caused by electrostatic induction. And the electrostatic discharge, or ESD, the sudden flow of electricity between two electrically charged objects caused by contact, knocked some people to the ground. The Great Snowstorm of 1831. There were some great eastern snowstorms 
Uh, they include January 27th of 1805, Christmas Eve of 1811, January 18th through the 19th, 1857, which I spoke of, March 12th through the 13th, 1888, that was known as the Blizzard of 88, and February 11th through the 14th, 1899. Now, there was a monster snowstorm in 1831 on January 14th and 15th that spanned the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Maine. Snow even fell in Georgia. Now, we know during the snowstorm that snow fell in Nantucket beginning at 7 a.m., and it began in Boston at 10 a.m. Two feet of snow fell in Mansfield, Mass. 36 inches of snow, three feet in New Bedford, and Cape Cod saw two to three feet as well. And violent wind caused six-foot-high snowdrifts, and the storm finally ceased on the 16th of January, 1831. I spoke about the triple storms of 1786 in December. We also had triple storms in December of 1839. Three gales of unequal fury struck on December 15th, the 21st, and the 27th in Boston in 1839. 90 ships were destroyed and 200 more were de dismasted and over 150 people lost their lives. December 15th, there were hurricane force winds and hail on Nantucket. The schooner Hesperus broke free and her jib boom went through the upper window of a four-story building. In Gloucester, over 50 vessels were dismasted, driven to shore, or carried out to sea. The shoreline was strewn with flotsam, rope and rigging, broken casks of cargo, and even dead bodies. Snowfall on the first storm, 16 inches in Hanover, New Hampshire. 20 inches in Concord, New Hampshire, and 18 inches in Amherst, Mass. The second storm began on December 22nd with heavy winds out of the Northeast, although only a couple of inches fell in Boston and three inches in Providence, New York City got seven inches of snow. The third storm, though, began on December 27th, and it was the most severe of all three. It always seems when we get these triple snowstorms, it's the third one that wallops us. Three and a half feet of snow fell on the Berkshires. The Green Mountains saw 16 inches, giving them a cumulative total over those three storms of 49 inches. Northwestern Connecticut saw three to four feet with 10 to 15 foot snowdrifts. Many ships were broken from their moorings. Several bridges in Charlestown and Warren, Mass were damaged. There were severe gale force winds in Boston. Another gale hit in October of 1841. In fact, uh, the Irish immigrant ship, the St. John, went down off the coast of Cohasset. There was wind, snow, and rain. It continued for four days from October 2nd through the 6th of October, and five and a quarter inches of rain fell in Boston. There were gale force winds that decimated fishing fleets in Maine, Cape Ann, and Cape Cod and the ship Maine was crushed against the glades in Cohasset, that's where the St. John went down, and driven onto the beach in Situate. And she was driven out of her harbor at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and dragged for 70 miles. All seven hands perished. The most violent damage was in Chatham, where 45 shipwrecks were cast on the beach and over 50 bodies were recovered. Now you can see this depiction. This is the cold storm of 1857. It was a violent storm that raced up from the Gulf of Mexico beginning on January 17th, and temperatures plummeted. It struck Massachusetts early on the morning of the 19th in 1857, leaving 18 inches of snow in Providence, 15 inches in New Bedford, and 14 inches in Boston. Provincetown suffered gale force winds for 24 hours and lost 17 of the 20 ships there. Other parts of the country saw extreme low temperatures, including Chicago, 40 below zero, Watertown, New York, 40 below zero, and Philadelphia, 10 below zero. The blizzard of 1888, here's a photo taken from that blizzard. New York City got hammered. And this followed a, a blizzard that struck the Midwest known as the children's blizzard. We did a segment on the folklorist about that. The blizzard of 1888, struck on March 11th and continued through March 14th, 1888. There was heavy drifting snowfall, gale force winds and bitter near zero cold. It paralyzed New York City, Southern New Hampshire and Vermont, Central and Western Massachusetts and most of Connecticut. Boston was spared. 
30 inches, 40 inches, and 50 inches of snow were reported in some localities. New Haven, Connecticut saw 46 inches. Middletown, Connecticut, 50 inches. Mount Monadnock in southwest New Hampshire received between 30 and 36 inches of snow. And Boston, which was east of the freezing line, received only nine inches of slush. Cape Cod got rain. The Portland Gale of 1898. This storm killed more than 400 people, sank more than 150 ships, and it also changed the course of the North River, separating the Humberock portion of Situate, Massachusetts from the rest of Situate. You can see this is a, a rare photograph before the Portland Gale, where Humberock and Situate were actually connected. And it also featured the steamship, the Portland. On November 26th through the 28th in 1898, the storm was forecasted, but Captain Blanchard sailed anyways in a side-wheeling steamer. He left Boston, uh, headed north towards Portland, Maine, uh, normally a several-hour run. He got blown towards the tip of Cape Cod and around the elbow of the Cape, doing it the wrong way, and they found debris and flotsam, wash up on shore. Eventually, it went down at, and where it still uh, uh, sits today at Stellwag, Stellwagen Bank on the floor uh, of Massachusetts Bay. Here's some photographs of 19th century snowfalls and late 19th century in Dorchester, Mass. 1890s, again, in Dorchester. Now, we're into the 20th century. And it was relatively dormant for over 50 years, almost 60 years in Boston in regard to blizzards. There were cold snaps, of course, but this is the wallop of 58. February 16th through February 17th, 1958, 19.4 inches of snow fell on Boston. Then, of course, I call it the March 1960 thumping. This took place March 3rd to the, through the 5th, 1960. 19.8 inches of snow fell in Boston, as depicted in this photograph. Then there was the 100-hour snowstorm of 1969. It was the first 20-inch snowstorm in Boston in 105 years since the National Weather Service kept records. I remember that as a child and my cousin coming home from Vietnam and having to stay over our house for a couple of days. Couldn't get out. We were in debt of Massachusetts at the time. So it began at 1.35 a.m. on February 24th, 1969, and concluded at 12.10 a.m. on February 28th. 26.3 inches of snow fell on Boston, as you can see by the photograph. 17 inches of snow fell in the first 36 hours. Boston suburbs received 30 inches of snow. Cape Ann got hit with 39 inches. Pinkham Notch in New Hampshire, here are their daily totals. February 25th, 1969, 21 inches. February 26th, 24 and a half inches. February 27th, 27 inches. And February 28th, 4.5 inches. A total accumulation of 77 inches. That's crazy. That's over six feet of snow. February of 1969 set a record for total snowfall in Boston with 41.3 inches of snow. It was broken in 2015. And we'll get to that miserable, miserable year. Then we had the White Christmas of 1975. From December 20th through the 22nd in 1975, 18.2 inches of snow fell on Boston. We had the pre-blizzard of 1978. People forget about this one. January 20th and the 21st of 1978, Boston saw 21.4 inches of snow. Now, the blizzard of 78 went from February 6th through the 7th. And 27.1 inches fell on Boston, 27.6 inches in Providence. The storm was primarily known as Storm Larry in Connecticut. That's because uh, there was a local convention that was promoted by the Travelers Weather Service uh, blasting on TV and radio stations there. No one was, you know, so when the snow began at 7.13 a.m. in Boston, nobody was alarmed, but nobody could imagine that it wouldn't stop for another 32 hours. And I think the only man who predicted that right, I think Don Kent and Barry Burbank 
meteorologists. Anyways, snow fell mostly from Monday morning, February 6th, through the evening of Tuesday, February 7th, in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, were hit especially hard by this storm. In the worst hit areas, nearly all economic activity was disrupted. The storm killed about 100 people in the Northeast, injured about 4,500, and it caused more than $520 million damage, which today is over $2 billion. Let's look at some photos here. I remember that we had to carry groceries from Westwood to Dedham by sled about six miles round trip. That's 128. My father took some famous photographs of that. That's heading towards Route 24. People literally got out of their cars and walked. It took days to shovel them out. I remember that because my brother and I, I believe, are the only people to jump off the Canton E Street overpass across Route 128 during rush hour and actually live to tell about it. <laughs> Into the deep snow we went up to here. Look at that, buried in rock along the coast. This is the North Shore near Marblehead, Marblehead, I believe. Again, situate. A lot of the houses along the coast, the only thing that was left standing was the toilet. Nothing to do but wait. Look at that. <laughs> That's in Boston, I think South Boston. Charlestown. Here goes my house. Look at the cars submerged in salt water. Can't recover them. Now, the Peter Stuyvesant, once a famed Hudson River riverboat, it was restored and made part of the Pier 4 restaurant in Boston's harborfront, but it was flooded by surging tide waters and left leaning and partially submerged, and the vessel later was demolished. Now, this is known as Motif Number 1, a fisherman's shack in Rockport. And it was to students of art and art history one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. But the relic was dumped into the harbor by the flood tides and towering waves. It's been since rebuilt. Skiing in Boston. <laughs> Get down from there. Snow dragon. By the time the storm ended on February 8th, over 11,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. Now let's talk about the storm of the century. It was formed March 11th, 1993, and it blitzed the East Coast from the 12th through the 13th. Alabama and Georgia, six to eight inches of snow. Birmingham, Alabama, 12 inches. The Panhandle, Florida, four inches. Hurricane force wind gusts and record low barometric pressures huge storm surges, and scattered tornadoes. The storm was responsible for 310 deaths and the loss of electric power to over 10 million customers. It is purported to have been directly experienced by over 130 million American people, about 40% of our country's population at that time. Then February 94, from February 8th to February 10th, 1994, 18.7 inches fell in Boston. Of course, you remember this one, Fenway Park, April Fool's Blizzard, March 31st to April 1st, 1997, 25.4 inches of snow in Boston. January 1996, January 7th through the 8th, 1996, Boston gets 18.2 inches. The President's Day Blizzard, this is February 17th through the 18th, 2003, 27.6 inches of snow fell on Boston. December 8th, 2003, another two-footer. I remember in Watertown, we had 30-inch snowdrifts. I took that photo of a mailbox near my apartment. January 05 blizzard. January 22nd through the 23rd, Boston gets 22 and a half inches. The Boxing Day blizzard. December 26th and 27th, 2010, 18.2 inches fell in Boston. Here's the map showing the hard hit areas, a swath right there. 
credit from Providence to Boston. January 12th, 2011 blizzard. This North American blizzard was a major mid-Atlantic nor'eastern winter storm and a New England blizzard. The highest amount of snow, snowfall was reported at Savoy, Massachusetts, Western Mass, 40 and a half inches of snow. It caused widespread airport delays and school closings in the region. In isolated amounts of more than two feet occurred in eastern Massachusetts, in Wilmington, Winchester, and Lexington. This blizzard, together with blizzards later in the month, is estimated to have led to a loss of 150,000 jobs in the United States for the month of January. And just two weeks later, January 25th through the 27th, 2011, another major nor'easter, it wasn't a blizzard, slammed into New England, leaving 10 to 15 inches in southern New England. Ah, now that bad winter 2015, blah. Boston set an all-time record for snowfall with 111 inches in one season. The record 30-day snowfall of 94.4 inches went from January 24th to February 22nd, 2015. February 2015 obliterated the previous snowiest month on record in Boston with 65 inches. January of 2005 had 43 inches. January of 1945 had 42 inches. February of 2003 had 42 inches. And February of 1969, 41 inches. Winter storm Juno from January 22nd through the 26th left 24.6 inches in Marcus, which hit from February 7th through the 10th, 23.8 inches, made the top 10 heaviest Boston snowstorms of all time. First of all time. February 7th through the 18th, 2003, 27.6 inches. February 6th through the 7th, blizzard of 78, 27.1. February 24th through the 26th, 1969, 25.8 inches. March 31st through April 1st, April Fool's storm, uh, 1997, 25.4 inches. February 8th through the 9th, uh, storm Nemo, 2013, 24.9. Juno, 26 through the 28th, 2015, 24.6 inches. It was an official blizzard. And then February 7th through the 10th, 2015, Marcus, 23.8 inches. And again, you can see uh, this is known as the, I call this the freezing cold Valentine of 2016. Look at the temperatures here. Boston, minus 9 degrees, the coldest since January 15th, 1957. Providence, coldest since January of 1984. Worcester, coldest since January of 1957. Albany, New York, minus 13, the coldest since January 24, 2011. Hartford, minus 12, the coldest since February of 1996. Watertown, New York, minus 37 degrees Fahrenheit, beating the previous record of minus 30 degrees. And the coldest temperatures were reported at Mount Washington, New Hampshire, at minus 40 below zero. Now, this one here is uh, the snow totals of 2015 to 2016. This is the next winter after that bad winter. And uh, snowfall totals for Massachusetts during January 24th through the uh, 22nd through the 24th in 2016, known as Jonas. You can see them leaving three to six in Boston, and but the Cape got walloped. 2017, January 7th and the 8th, 2017, winter storm Helena. Massachusetts got 19.5 inches in East Bridgewater, 7.2 inches at Logan Airport. Winter storm Nico brought heavy snow, blizzard conditions, and high winds to a swath of the Northeast during a brief one-day siege on February 9, 2017. There's the map there. You can see to the west uh, in Townsend, Mass., North Central Mass., got the brunt of it. February 13, 2017, winter storm Orson, Massachusetts, had 16 inches in Heath, um, also 15 inches in Savoy, Mass. They're way out west in the western part of the state, and 3.7 inches at Logan. Now, March 14th to March 15th, 2017, winter storm Stella. Major blizzard Eugene, it was called, struck New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, southern Quebec. 160 flights were canceled in Boston, but it was too warm, 40 degrees Fahrenheit for snow. Hurricane force wind gusts, though, however, nearly 80 miles per hour were recorded on Cape Cod and 77 miles per hour on Plum Island. And this nor'easter produced maximum wind gusts at elevation of 128 to 138 miles per hour at Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Look at that. 
when it moved in a winter hurricane. And then the bomb cyclone, you remember that? It covered the entire East Coast on January 4th, 2018. Massachusetts bore the highest impacts of all American states as winds gusted to hurricane force at 76 miles per hour in Nantucket and over 70 miles per hour on the North Shore. At least 17 inches of snow fell on Boston and a storm tide of 15.16 feet flooded the financial district and T stations. It was the highest tide known as a king tide or spring tide comes at a full moon in Boston's history. There you can see downtown near the aquarium bust uh, T station. Now, the double March wallops of 2018. There was a nor'easter on March 2nd, hurricane force winds, 97 miles per hour at Wellfleet. Amazing. A 78 miles per hour in Boston, a Boston flood tide at the third highest tide in history, 14.67 feet. You can see the photos there. And waves were described as higher than a two-story house, 1,800 people evacuated in situate. Downtown, look at that, at the wharf. Just looking at some great Boston floods, as I mentioned, January 4th, 2018, 15.16 feet. February 7th, blizzard 78, 15.1. March 2nd, 2018, 14.67. January 2nd, 1987, 14.2. October 30th, 1991, 14.14. Now again, March 13th, the Cape and the Islands had wind gusts over 60 miles per hour. Trees down everywhere. 14.8 inches of snow in Boston, 28.3 inches in Methuen. Go figure, 15.1 in Weymouth. There's the map. Look at that, Holliston. West Newton got hammered two feet. There's a swath of snow there. Douglas Mass, 25 inches. Crazy totals. Then, 2019, pfft, nothing. Boston had an exceptionally snowless winter with only 27.4 inches accumulating, far short of its seasonal average of 43.8 inches, though a long way from its record low seasonal snowfall of just 9 inches, which took place in the winter of 1936 to 1937. <clears throat> However, Boston did have its slowest start on record for a snow season, receiving just 0.2 inches as of mid-January 2019. But then came March Madness, March 3rd and 4th, 2019. It was a hit-and-run snowstorm, dumped about a foot of sticky snow on the city in points north, 15 inches in Hopkinton, 15 inches in Canton. There's the map there showing Sharon got hit with 16.2. Then December 3rd, 2019, last winter. The highest snow totals were found in Worcester County, where Winchington, Royalston, and Hubbardston each got 25 inches of snow on December 3rd, 2019. Other towns in Western Mass also got two feet of snow. Eastern Mass got hit hard with a little under 18 inches in Acton, Dracut, and Littleton. Dude, can you do my driveway? It's snow tonight. And then 2020. This is a storm here that took place. April 18th, 2020, you remember that one? A wet late season snow. And then of course, October 30th, 2020, Worcester and Grafton got six and a half inches. Natick and Westboro, six inches. Boston set a record for the most snowfall in October with 4.8 inches. And then December 16th through the 17th, 2020, I call it Snowvid. Boston got 10.3 inches. Waltham, my home here got 16 inches. Again, an anomaly. So what are the snowiest places in Massachusetts in the last 15 years? Fitchburg, 82.2 inches annually. Haverhill Lawrence gets 67.3 inches a year. Worcester, 64.1. Pittsfield, 62.1. And go figure, Lowell, 61.6 inches of snow annually. Now the average annual snowfall in Massachusetts is 44 inches. And in 2014, 2015, as I mentioned, 111 inches, 110.6. 2004, 2005, 86.6. In 2010 through 2011, 81 inches. Just looking at some major snowfalls as I reiterate, February 17, 2003, 23.6 inches fell in one day in Boston. April Fool's Day, 22.4 inches fell in Boston. Uh, well, actually, recently, uh, you can see the 21st of 22.1 uh, inches, January 27, 2015, that bad winter. So as I record this uh, on uh, January 27, 2021, it's snowing out. 
Well, we're not through the snow season yet in any year. So I hope you're careful during the snow. Watch the ice and peace be with you. I'm John Horrigan. This has been Great New England Blizzards. Thanks so much for joining me.